Welcome to the BYU Library Family History webinar. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Olivia Tuller, and I'll be your host for this webinar. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You're welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments, insights, and questions. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar is on February 23rd with Roger Miner. He will be giving a presentation entitled German Census Records from 1816 to 1916. If you would like to access the previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from Maureen Brady, who will be giving a presentation on the first frontiersman, the Scots-Irish. Before we begin, here's a little bit about Maureen. Maureen Brady, a former school librarian and computer educator, has over 35 years experience with family history research. She has traced her Scottish roots back to the end of the 17th century and beyond, and has also pursued Chicago in the Midwest, trans allegheny U.S., Quebec, and Irish and Swedish research. Maureen has made numerous presentations to Illinois and Wisconsin genealogical societies, libraries, conferences, and workshops, including presenting at the 2002 National Genealogical Society Conference in the States and the 2016, 2017, and 2018 Central Florida Family History Conference. She is a member of the Genealogical Speakers Guild, as well as a life member of the Aberdeen and Northeast Scotland Family History Society, the Chicago Genealogical Society, the Ohio Geneal Genealogy Society, and the McHenry County, Illinois Genealogical Society. She is also active in the British Interest Group of Wisconsin and Illinois, the Chicago Scotch Genealogical Group, and the Lake County, Illinois Genealogical Society. And if Maureen is ready, we can go ahead and turn the time over to her. There we go, okay. So we're talking about the first frontiersman, and the reason I've chosen that title is I think here in the United States, at least, when we think about the first frontier that we experienced here in our history, we are thinking about the colonists moving over the Allegheny Mountains into the what was then the frontier of the United States. And so that's why I talk about this as the first frontiersman. But first, let's talk a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, about who the Scots-Irish are. First of all, that term, Scots-Irish, is only used here in the United States. In Ireland, they are referred to as the Ulster Scots, and that usually is the term used throughout the British Isles. And then in various other parts of the uh, Irish diaspora, Australia, for instance, and so on, they have come up with other terms which are local for their use. So the Scots-Irish really refer to specifically settlers here in the United States. So the Scots-Irish then are U.S. descendants of Ulster Protestants who emigrated to North America during the 18th century, Ulster being a province of Ireland. Their ancestors had originally migrated in the 17th century to the Ulster province of Ireland, primarily from the Scottish and English border area. Now, certainly there were others who came from other parts of Scotland, but the vast majority came from that Scottish-English border. And then <clears throat> during the late 18th after the Revolutionary War and the early 19th century, they then moved west into Western Pennsylvania, Western Virginia, the Carolinas, Kentucky, and Tennessee. And with Western Virginia in that time period, that includes today's state of West Virginia. Let's take a look, though, at some historical highlights. I always like to talk about history before I talk about records, because the history determines what records were created, which ones survived, and possibly even where they're kept. So let's first talk about the plantation of Ulster, beginning in 1609 to about the period of 1641. This was the heaviest period of plantation, as they call it, and their records are not <clears throat> really kept in the sense of who went from Scotland to England to Ireland because they were just moving across the water. But there are estate records which could be accessed in Ireland in person, primarily in Belfast, though some in Dublin. So why were the borderers chosen to be the ones planted? 
That seems to be the main question here. So first of all, the borders themselves, the border area between Scotland and England was considered lawless. That was occupied on both sides of the border by people who considered themselves outside of control or under not under the law of the English king. And that would have been James the first or sixth, depending on which country you were in. They'd considered themselves to be independent, to establish their own rules and follow their own rules. So the government of Scotland and England, that is James, considered them to be lawless. There had there was need to keep military force there to keep them under control. Military force then also meant forts and so on. And at the same time, coincidentally, was the troubles, as I put in quotes, with the Catholic Irish, primarily in the area of the province of Ulster. That was the most heavily Gaelic area that had not had much contact with the British in the earlier centuries, who really did not consider themselves of any way, shape, or form under English control, just as the border people did not. And so we had the lawless along the borders uh, between Scotland and England, and then we had the troubles with the Catholic Irish and Ulster. So the solution, as far as James was concerned, was to, to put a Protestant presence in Ulster, and by doing so, he could move the people from the borders who were creating all the problems there into Ulster and solve the Catholic problem because they'd be all Protestant. And then they also, it would also save money and resources because he would not have to have the military present in both areas. He could just be watching Ulster, that the area along the border with Scotland and England would quiet down. And so he could then move on to other priorities. <clears throat> so let's take a look at this. Here we have Scotland. The, the border today is right about in here, roughly. We have England, Wales. This is today's Northern Ireland. Most of that or all of that would have been part of Ulster, but Ulster also included some other areas here. I'll show you in a moment. And then we have the Republic of Ireland today. The border people from Scotland came primarily from Ayr, Dumfries, Roxburgh, and Wigtown, the counties of that area, primarily here, coming all the way over from the Irish Sea. This is the Irish Sea. It's only 20 miles across from Ireland to Scotland at this point. So from the Irish Sea over to the North Sea, roughly, and then along the border, which is approximately here. On the English side, they came primarily from Cumberland and Westmoreland, which is roughly in this area. And then they were then moved across the water to the province of Ulster, planted there. It was the term that came up in their English, old, older English form of that word, and meaning they were settled there. And that's why we call it the plantation of Northern Ireland. Now here's another map. This is a current map of the counties of Ireland. And this section up here, the orangish and the green, that is the old province of Ulster. And the, all of these counties were settled or planted by Scots and English coming across from that border area primarily with the heaviest concentrations in Antrim, Down, Armagh, Manahan, and Tyrone, and Londonderry. So this is the area that today is Northern Ireland, part of the United Kingdom. These three counties are part of the Republic. And there was heavy Catholic prob had, excuse me, heavy Catholic presence in these two counties in particular, and also somewhat in Donegal. So that's one of the reasons, one of many, that they stayed with the Republic or became part of the Republic when the division occurred in the 1920s. <clears throat> so the first question I often get asked when I'm working a genealogy booth for our Scottish Gen Society is, is my family named Scots-Irish or is it English or is it Scottish or whatever? And there's two ways to quickly answer that in a very generic way. First was the family Presbyterian or at least not Catholic. And secondly, 
is it a surname found in that border area? If you can answer they were Presbyterian or at least not Catholic, yes, and the surname came from the borders, then they are likely to be a Scots-Irish family coming out of Ulster to the United States from that area. Now, that is not to say that was exclusively when, they, when those names appeared in the United States. Certainly, there was continuing immigration for a couple of centuries, but the, the vast bulk of them in the area that we're going to be talking about for the Scots-Irish would have been from the borders and would have been Presbyterian or at least not Catholic. So how do you find out if they're from the borders? Well, in your bibliography, <clears throat> there is a book by George Black. It's the very first one in your bibliography called The Surnames of Scotland. And Mr. Black did a very ex exhaustive study of the origin of the names in Scotland and where they occurred and in what documents they could be found so that you could get a sense of where that surname occurred historically. And I'm not talking about those maps that you always see at Highland Games and such. This is from the actual historical documents. <clears throat> so if you open up this, I'm going to give you one example. This is the surname Moffat. And his book tells us that Moffat is of local origin from the town of Moffat in Annandale, Dumfriesshire. Well, that's one of the border counties. So this would indicate that this could very easily be a Scots-Irish name here in the United States. And you can see he even offers some spelling options based upon a document. And he shows you the year that that spelling was found. There's this W, which is really, I thought was very, very interesting for an O sound. So this is the kind of entry you're going to find in the surnames of Scotland. Many, 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 many libraries have it. But as I've also determined, it is available on Family Search in their book section, and I'll show you later how you would find it. So we've got somewhat of a definition of the Scots-Irish, where they came from and why they're called that. So let's talk about their movement. So first, after they were settled in Ulster, Ulster became difficult to live in for many, many people economically. The farms were very small, and by Irish law and practice, they were always given to all of the children equally. So if you had 10 acres and 10 children, each child got one acre to farm and so on. There was also the ever-present British Army, which what many of them would have thought was a bit too much. And so around 1717, they started coming over here to the North American colonies, excuse me. So I have some quotes here that I think describe this quite well. And please bear with me while we do this. I felt that they could say it better than I could. This is from a review of um, one of the books in the bibliography, Albion Seed, which I will also talk about later. In by far the largest migration, poor borderland families of Scots and Irish fled a violent environment to seek a better life in a similarly uncertain American backcountry, fleeing Ulster over to the American colonies. Their place, the most of them went to was Penn's Woods. This is a, a bust of William Penn. And since he was a Quaker, his grant of land, he opened up to anyone in any religion. There was no state religion and at that point in time was the only part of the colonies that did not have a state religion. And you can see here, Penn's Woods were a little bit of Maryland, a little bit of Delaware, we have New Jersey, and then this Eastern portion of Pennsylvania, accessible up the Delaware River by ship to the port of Pennsylvania, of Philadelphia. So the, because of this religious freedom, and the fact that there was little control of the British government here because it was Penn's Woods, he was the one in control. The Scots-Irish were attracted to this area. They knew they could get land. They knew they could have a lot of freedom of movement and of how they lived their life. So they all, most of them then came to Penn's Woods through Philadelphia. 
but we're not going to find passenger lists because they're moving from one part of the British Empire to another. Back to my little descriptions. This one it was by Dr. Samuel Johnson, a very famous author who wrote many, many uh, views of the American colonies and the life here. And this one I think is very telling. Whole neighborhoods formed parties for removal. So that departure from their native country, that is Ulster, is no longer exile. He that goes thus accompanied carry with them their language, their opinions, their popular songs, and hereditary merriment. They change nothing but the place of their abode. So because they came often in groups from their towns, they just brought everything with them and just changed where they lived. Another quote, this is from the review of Albion Seed again, they were poor and came from a survival-oriented culture. They brought with them an idea of natural freedom that was not necessarily consonant with law and order. And this could also therefore be very much the description of the people of the borders of Scotland and England, and one of the reasons James needed to control it. Albion Seed, I've mentioned it now twice. Again, this is also in your handout in the bibliography. I cannot recommend this book more than enough. I mean, this is a fantastic book. It explains the four British folkways, as he calls it, that settled the American colonies before the revolution. He talks about the culture, the society, the mores, the educational customs, marriage customs, all sorts of things. And it really is a very enlightening book, very, very easy to read, lots of charts and so on. And I cannot highly recommend this enough, but we're gonna look at his section on the Scots-Irish. And this is quoting from the book, from Albion Seed. Early in the summer of 1717, the people of Philadelphia observed that immigrant ships were arriving in more than their usual numbers. They came from Belfast, Londonderry, and Carrick Fergus. These new immigrants dressed in outlandish ways. The men were tall and lean with hard weather beaten faces. They wore felt hats, loose sackcloth shirts, close belted at the waist, baggy trousers, thick yarn stockings, and wooden shoes shod like a horse's feet with iron. The young women startled Quaker Philadelphia by the sensuous appearance of their full bodices, tight waists, bare legs, and skirts as scandalously short as an English undershift. And finally, the speech of these immigrants was English, but they spoke with a lilting cadence that rang strangely in the ear. Many were desperately poor, but even in their poverty, they carried themselves with a fierce and stubborn pride that warned others to treat them with respect. All of these elements, at least in terms of being opinionated, independent, and then being fierce pride and so on, that's carried down through the generations with the Scots-Irish. And if you know anyone today who came out of Kentucky, Tennessee, the Carolinas, into Southern Illinois, Southern Indiana, and then moved West. This might very well describe them and their ancestors. This was something that was very much part of their being, and they carried it with them across the frontier, and perhaps one could say why they survived the frontier. So they have moved across into Pennsylvania, and more of more people come to Pennsylvania, the Quakers, the Huguenots, and the uh, German Anabaptists the, who became the Amish and Mennonites, all have also coming into Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania starts getting a little too crowded. And so as farms are established by the Germans and the Quakers and so on, the Scots-Irish keep moving west until they come to the Great Valley. And this would have been around 1740, and then continued until the time of the revolution, movement into the Great Valley of what we call the Great Valley of Virginia, which is the Shenandoah Valley at the northern end, and then it goes down toward Roanoke, and then we have the New River Valley at the southern end. 
but it is the great valley between the ridges of the Alleghenies, of the Appalachians, and it is very easy even then, and once you establish some kind of a road, to go on down through this. So here's a map. This came from the Scotsman newspaper that they posted in their Facebook post way back in August of 2016. But it's an excellent view of where both the Highland Scots and the Scots-Irish settled because it shows how much different their settlements were. The green are the Scots coming out of the Highlands, out of uh, Skye and Caithness and Sutherland and Inverness and so forth. They came down into the pe Tidewater, Pennsylvania and up the Hudson River Valley, heading up and toward eventually Canada. But they came in through New York. This one group came in through the Carolinas. But the Scots-Irish are your red line here. Now you do see a little bit of them coming into Boston for the for the uh, factory work that's up there. But primarily they're coming in up to the Philadelphia port on the Delaware River, moving west into western central Pennsylvania, down the Great Valley of Virginia, and then either taking the Great Wilderness Road to Kentucky and Tennessee, or continuing down that valley and in between the ridges down into the back country of the Carolinas across the first ridge. So they're up in the highlands of the Carolinas here, or they're into Virginia, Tennessee, and Kentucky over here. This is the primary movement of the Scots-Irish pre-revolution. So then we're going to, they're down there now in the Great Valley of, Cal of Virginia, settling there, getting land, creating farms. Then along comes 1775 and Daniel Boone goes to the Cumberland Gap, which is right here. And this is the state of Virginia as it was at the time. This is today's Kentucky, this dotted line. This is the line for Tennessee, dividing it from the Carolinas, specifically North Carolina. So strategically, this Cumberland Gap is right at the point where all four states meet. And it is also the only opening in the continuous Cumberland Mountain Ridge Line. It is the only point where you can get across those mountains quickly. Olivia, do you still see me? Um, yes, it is flickering green, but it shouldn't be a problem. We can still see your presentation. Okay. It's not doing anymore. <laughs> Uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Okay. So in 1775, Daniel Boone, who had been across the Cumberland Gap himself a couple of times, mostly for hunting and just kind of exploring. But in 1775, he took a company of men with him to begin to widen the path to make it easier for settlement on the other side of those ridges in today's Kentucky and Tennessee. And by the 1790s, the trail had become wide enough to take wagon traffic and became known as the Wilderness Road. Now this whole thing plus a lot more is from Wikipedia if you want to go and read the whole article. So here's a map from the National Park because there is a National Park uh, Center in Cumberland Gap. But here we are at Philadelphia. Pre-75, we have the purple line that goes out to the middle of Pennsylvania then down the Great Valley Road, Shenandoah Valley here, New River Valley here, and then through the Cumberland Gap, which is right about in here, into then, oh, there's the Cumberland Gap, I'm sorry, then up into Kentucky. This was the way that Daniel Boone forged it. Originally, there is some early settlement of the Scots-Irish down here, in the far northeastern corner of Tennessee, Bristol area particularly, because it was still at the end of this valley with the New River. Another way to look at this is taking a look at this map, which now shows here's the Mississippi River over here. The first one of the movements was down through from the Valley of Virginia, down through continuing through that ridge line or between those ridges down into the back country of North Carolina. 
with the Great Smoky Mountains here and the Blue Ridge here. If you've ever been on the Blue Ridge Highway going up to Shenandoah, this is the ridge it's following. This is the ridge of the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. So that was one movement, but the majority of them continued on to the west end of the valley, connecting up with the Wilderness Road that was originally forged by Daniel Boone, and then kept going all the way to the Ohio River at Louisville. So that now connected everyone from Virginia and Pennsylvania back here, all the way up through Kentucky to the Ohio River, and now gave them Ohio River transportation possibilities. But then there was another group that started from here and took the water route. The Tennessee River, the, the headwaters of the Tennessee River are right up in this area. So you get in the Tennessee, you come down the Tennessee through Northern Alabama. It cuts back up into Tennessee, then continues up to the Ohio River. Paducah's over here, if you have any idea of where Kentucky cities are. So it comes up to the Ohio, and then it's just a few miles upriver on the Ohio is the mouth of the Cumberland. So then you come back down the Cumberland to Middle Tennessee to a fort called Fort Nashboro, established in the mid 1780s, right after the end of the Revolutionary War. And now you can open up this area of Tennessee. So one group down into the Carolinas, one group down the valley and then the wilderness road to Louisville, and one group taking the water route into central Tennessee. Those are our main areas of settlement at before 1800. So if you're looking for your Scots-Irish families, this is the area that you would need to be focusing on in terms of records, whatever records there may be, land grants, bounty records for Revolutionary War service, wills, probates, and so on. Once they settled this area, the next area of settlement for most of these people, when they decided to move west, was up here along the Ohio and the Wabash and parts of the Mississippi in southern Illinois, southern Indiana, and southern Ohio but mostly down here. If I've been working on a family and they are settled right about here in 1805, coming from Tennessee, the husband came from Tennessee, the wife's family came from Kentucky and they met up here and were married here around 1805. So you can see the movement of the people and these would still be very much in custom and in law and in attitude, Scots-Irish. They retained it even to this point. So now let's talk about finding the records. I took you up to just about 1800, and then if they become part of the whole westward movement, Texas becoming one of their major states, as well as Missouri and Arkansas, and then eventually going on to California for the gold rush. So let's start talking about finding the records in the next half hour. In this section, I'm going to show you some of the sites and what is there, at least a little sampling of it. I am not going to tell you how to use the sites. I have made the assumption that you can figure that out for yourself. Mainly what I want you to see is some of the things that are available, some of the record sources that are there that might help you with your research. So starting with Pennsylvania, these URLs are all in your handout. They have three major record sources online, both indexes and digital records for the pre-colonial period in Pennsylvania. And they include the land records of the area, the maps of the area and the Revolutionary War pension records, as well as tax, tax lists of individual townships and counties. Most of that is organized by township. So that's why the land records are a good place to start because then you can identify specific land, land townships where they live to be able to access those tax records. Now, this is in the Pennsylvania archives online, and they also have guides to what they have hold for individual uh, counties within Pennsylvania 
There's also one for the overview of the war, but you can see we have Bucks County and Cumberland and so on. These are all guides. They are not the actual records. It tells you how to find the records, which ones are online and which ones you'd have to order or go to Pennsylvania to view. But if you can, these, this is an example of one of their abstract record cards, what they are calling an index. And this is for Henry Lott. He was in active duty, which means he didn't actually go into an active battle, but he's part of the Associators of Bucks County in the township of Solbury. He was in Captain John Coriel's company period of 1775 to 1776, and he enrolled on August 21st, 1775. And then it tells us where his records are. It's in volume and page number and so forth. And you would have to go to the archives to actually see it. So this is one entry of thousands of the men from Pennsylvania who may or may not have served actively, but at least were enrolled in the militia within the Pennsylvania Commonwealth. The next one is the Virginia memory following that path from Pennsylvania down the Virginia Valley. Here's the library. Virginia has set up a wonderful website. They call it Virginia memory. And there's two ways to access what's in there, either an A to Z alphabetical list of all of their collections or by topic. You do have to play around with this to find colonial era and up to 1800 records because it's, uh, it, it is grouped by very broad topic. But once you do, there's a huge library of material there, land records and other such. And here's a couple of them, something called Chancery Records Index. And I'll show you a sample of that in a minute. Bounty land claims for a service in the militia of the Revolutionary War for Virginia. Pension records for that as well. So this is from the chancery records, or rather the pension records. And I do certify that John Williamson, a soldier of the 14th Virginia Regiment, enlisted the first day of April, 1777, and so forth. So this not only tells you that he was in the army, but it also tells you the particular unit he was in, when he was discharged, and when this document was made. So you get some information here about movement, and you might also have witnesses and such. This is just the beginning of his pension file. Moving down then to North Carolina, we have something called digital collections. Again, they are also trying to digitize their early records. They are alphabetized somewhat in alphabetical order or chronologically, a little bit like Pennsylvania. You're going to have to work your way through it. But there's Bible records, there's tax lists, there's a vast majority of a vast library material here. And to give you an example here, Will of John McGee from Guilford County, the colony of North Carolina, state of North Carolina, but this is before the revolution. So remember, it is still a colony. So 1773, and here is the beginning of his four page will outlining all of his big lease and so on. Lots of people named in this will. And the other reason I picked it is pay attention to your dates because if it's before 1775, we are talking about the colonies of British North America. And much of that information is going to be found at the public record office in Q, which I'm not even discussing here, but keep in mind when you're talking about colonial records, a lot of it went back to England and only after 1775 to 1787 would you start then looking on this side of the water for all of the records, just as a reminder. So now we cross the mountains on the Wilderness Road or down the rivers into Tennessee, going to the Kentucky State Digital Archives first, and they have again a, a not much online digitally with lots of indexes though, telling you what's available should you go to the archives in person. They are not yet as a state digitizing their information or their documents. Some of it is on fold three, some of it's on ancestry, some of it is on individual county websites, but as a state level archive, 
they're not really doing much in the way of digitizing, just indexing and giving you guides to the records. And then finally, the Tennessee State Archives, the website is called Researchers and Genealogists of the State Library. They have a wonderful library there. They've been doing uh, a lot of work with their digitizing for well over 10 years. Here is their genealogy source index. It's listed right on the opening page, so you can get to it very quickly. You can see some of it is quite recent, but here's the Nashville newspapers all the way back to 1855, death notices. We have tenancy de death records are quite late, but we have, uh, we're gonna come back to X of Tennessee in a minute because I've mentioned that. We've got penitentiary records. We have Southern Claims Commission that comes from Civil War era. We have Tennessee Biographical Index. You can just keep going. All of these are digital records online at the Tennessee State Archives. And then in addition, of course, everything that's there in person should you go to Nashville. They have a new facility there specifically built for researchers. So to give you two examples, and this one I'm going to walk through a little bit, because this was an amazing source for me. If you find your family in Tennessee in the early, in the 1800 to 1830 period, you have to check the acts of Tennessee, even if you suspect that they may have come through Tennessee. The acts of Tennessee is an index to the actual acts of the Tennessee General Assembly. Now you would think, well, why would I worry about the statewide General Assembly? That's not going to have the information I need. Well, in the early period, before the counties were organized, that is with an office, a government body, they had people working in the office, they had a courthouse to store things in, if they needed to have some legal action taken, that is the residents of Tennessee needed to have a legal action of some sort, the only way they could do it previous to the organization of their county was to petition the Tennessee General Assembly to pass an act for that legal, doc, legal act that they needed. So you can see here, there's over 22,000 names in this index. And so I'm walking you through it because wait till you see what I can find. So I went and looked for Cantrell amongst others. Olivia, mine's flickering again. So if you lose me, let me know. So here we're, I was looking for Stephen Cantrell. So we, here we have three entries for Stephen Cantrell. It tells me the year the act was passed tells me how to find the act. And then this one is something about the Davidson Account Academy in Davidson County. And this is funding for state acad academies. But this one here in the middle seemed interesting. Children legitimized. So Stephen Cantrell in 1803 petitioned the state general assembly, the Tennessee General Assembly to legitimize his children. And you think, well, what in the world is that about? So I took a look. There's Stephen, and it says 5010. If I come up here, there are four names, and there's more above it, that all say 5010, and their name was changed. Now, this is just an index, and this is as much as I'm going to find. But I went to the archives, and I actually looked this up once, and Stephen Cantrell had around 10 children, all of whom are named in this index as having their name changed. And he was asking the state legislature to legitimize these children now that Stephen has married their mother. And then actually gave the date of the mothers of their marriage. So he had 10 children listed with their year of birth and asking them to be legitimized as the child of Stephen and his wife, Mary Blakemore. This was such a fantastic piece of information because not only did it name all the children, I got the marriage date and so forth. These acts of Tennessee are well worth checking out. If you have any idea, your family may have been in those early decades of Tennessee. 
pension applications for the Confederate Army. They have a lot of this material and these are digitized online. So here's Stephen H. Foster. He served in the 7th Infantry of the Confederate Army out of Sumner County. I can get his actual pension information online, which then led me to history books online through Tennessee. And here is the pictorial history of Sumner County. And there is Oliver H. Foster in 1890 at a picnic with reunion of all of the Confederate veterans. And there he is right here in the front row. So you can even find material like this through these state archives. Now, moving on to other sources in the last 15 minutes or so, starting with Family Search, it's free. We should all know about Family Search. And I want to look at two to help you with re finding records and databases for your future further research. The first is the Research Wiki. So, on the home page for Family Search, after you've signed in, you're going to come up to search and choose Research Wiki right here at the bottom. I checked this afternoon, they haven't changed it, so it's still at the bottom. And it goes to this page. So you come up here and you enter the state that you're working in. So let's start with Tennessee. And as soon as I type the word Tennessee, it will open up this drop-down box showing me all of the articles in the wiki pertaining to Tennessee records. So there's one, there's a trail, there's a civil war and so on. The first one, United States genealogy is the one you want to pick because that's the broader article that gives you the broader base for all of Tennessee research. So you go there, open that up and you get this screen and then it keeps going. This is a very, very long screen with lots and lots of links and ideas and background of using doing genealogy in the state of Tennessee. This is available for every state and on the side, every province of Canada, all of the counties of the British Isles, should you be going back into, into Ulster or Scotland, and even most of the countries of the world have some kind of a page similar to this. In your handout, I printed, I gave you one, two samples from the wiki page so that you have something to make notes on. So you're going to have some of this background. You can see boundary changes and so on. But what I want to really focus on in this presentation is the blue button. All of these have a blue button. And it says Gene online genealogical records. So you, you click that. And now you get a list of databases organized by topic. And in some cases by time frame, you notice the military records are divided by time frame. And there's links then to those databases, not only at Family Search, but also at Ancestry, at uh, Billion Graves, at the Newberry Library for those of us with Chicago, well, for the whole United States. There's Find a Grave, there's a Fold Three, there's Find My Past. All of the partner sites to fold to Family Search, if they have a, a web, an index, or a database that's pertinent to the state and the topic, it will be listed here. The dollar sign will tell you if it's something with a fee. If there is no dollar sign, it's free. It will tell you if there's actual digital images or if it's just an index. Again, in your handout at the back page, I've given you a sample of this page so that you can make notes. And it goes on longer than this. This isn't the whole list. I just took the first part of it. But you can see we've got births, marriages, deaths. We have Bible records. We have land records and so forth. And then the breakdown by the military. And you notice that they would like you to go to the US military online genealogy records, which is even a very ex extensive list of military records. So that's what's available through the wiki. You'll spend hours working your way through it and you will be coming back to it a lot. There are also wiki pages for any county in the United States. Excuse me, and this one is for Sumner County, Tennessee, as an example. 
You can see the outline of all of the topics that are covered. It gives you some basics like where the courthouse is, how you can contact them, where the archives are. Many states now, the courthouse and the archives are in separate buildings in many of the counties because the courthouse was getting too crowded with material, with records. And so they built archives to take the older records. You get the key dates and so on, but that's just the beginning. You have all of this for each county in the United States. Now, some of them are going to have a bit more information, but they're all going to be organized in the same way. In addition, migration trails also have their own articles in the wiki. This one is the Wilderness Road, and you can see here's the length of it up to Boonesboro originally, and then the offshoot that went to the Ohio, which is Louisville. And here's the outline for that. And then you can get various links to records representing the Wilderness Trail, the Wilderness Road, and all of the migration trails that I've mentioned into Kentucky and Tennessee, all of them have articles in the wiki. Now, the other thing is the library, the digital books. It is now right above the research wiki is the books section. This is a digital library of over 500,000 books. Family histories, county histories, tax lists, school histories, school lists, church lists, cemetery lists, it goes on and on and on. So when you choose books, you'll get this search screen and you can start typing in keywords or you can go to advanced search and the advanced search allows you to do keyword or look for a specific title or a subject or a specific author or combinations of all of this. So to demonstrate, I know there's a book called John Blair, of Guilford County, North Carolina, and some of his descendants. And I would like to see if this book is available here in the digital library. Well, I could type out the whole title, but I don't need to because in the title field, I'm just typing the main words, Blair, that's the surname, the county and the state, North Carolina. And then I hit search and I get a list up here, you can see there are 65,746 matches in the books part of Family Search. Now, this is a little, well, it's more than a little misleading. If I go back to the previous page, it is searching and finding every entry with the word Blair, every entry with the word Guilford every entry with the word North and every entry with the word Carolina. It does not take it as a phrase for Blair and Guilford and North Carolina. It treats it individually. And that's why I have so many hits up here, but it will show me the ones at the top that are most likely to be matches to my four key words. And the first one is Guilford County, North Carolina. But here, the second one is the book I'm looking for, John Blair of Guilford County, North Carolina and some of his descendants. So I can click on that, download the digital copy of the entire book to my hard drive or USB flash drive, whichever I prefer. The entire book comes down as a PDF document in Adobe document, which means that every word in the book is searchable. So all I have to do is do a control find, enter the word Edgar because I'm looking for Edgar Blair and it pops down to, here's my Edgar Blair, born in 1867, died in 1964. He's, here's his siblings, here's his parents. And here's the lineage going back. And then I can go and search for other members of the family or keep following it back as I so choose. Every word searchable in PDF format. And all you have to do is download it to your hard drive or to your USB flash drive. And these are all public domain. If it isn't, it will tell you that it is not and that you can't download it. 
but that's very few in terms of the total number. And it becomes part of your library collection. It is your book to keep and you don't have to go online anymore to look at it. You just have it on your own computer. So that was the book section. Now moving to fold three, there are two areas particularly that'll be helpful. The US Revolutionary War section under United States and the War of 1812 section. Now looking at the US Revolutionary War, this is just a portion of what's available on fold three, but you can see we have Navy casualty reports, final payment vouchers for Georgia. We have foreign burial of American war dead that could be in Canada, military history. This is just a sampling of everything that's on fold three, a very, very large collection of material, especially for the Revolutionary War. So as an example, Here's Henry Lott's relative. He may or may not be a son or a nephew, but this is the Revolutionary War pension file for Jeremy Lott, served from Pennsylvania. This is page one of 92 pages in his pension file. All of it available on Fold 3 in digital format that I can download to my own computer. And here's a little portion of it that tells me he when he enlisted in 1776 in Cap Captain John Dorsey's Company of Light Dragoons and so on. And then it keeps going from there. So Fold 3, Revolutionary War. Remember that anybody who served in the Revolutionary War would have been a British subject prior to that. And so you would have records in, perhaps in queue for that family. Then finally, Ancestry. And this is in your handout as reminders. But the first thing, this is the David Dobson is in your bibliography, some of his books. David Dobson has written over 90 books at this point, but many of them are focused on the Scots-Irish. And these are three of them, Irish Immigrants to North America, the 10th part. So this is already the 10th volume of this. Then we have Scotland during the plantation of Ulster and he has books for each of the counties. So here's Renfrew. And then another one called Scots Irish Links. And this one is volume six. So we are looking for Dobson's books. Many libraries will have some. I don't know if they'd ever have all, but Ancestry has some of them online. So you go up to search and then you go to the car catalog. And when the card catalog, you enter Dobson in the keyword, and it comes up with every Dobson book that Ancestry has in digital format that you can go through and search through for your family. And here's an example of what these books look like. They are mainly, they're not exactly indexes, but he went back into the records of the time, the 17th and 18th century, and identified people who likely were of Scots-Irish or Scottish or whatever, and then gave a short extraction of what that entry was. So here we have Alexander Agnew. He is from Belly McClock, died on the 29th of August, 1700. His wife was Jane McCoy. She was born in 1652, died in 1723. And here's the reference for where that comes from. And at the beginning of the book, he has all of this outlined as to what these particular references are. And then you would, of course, have to find that reference either in an archive or to write them to get a copy of it. But you would at least get an idea of some possible record for your family. And if you also look at this, look at Agnew. We have Belfast. Carney is also in Scotland. We have a student who is in Edinburgh who was an Anglican priest, that doesn't sound Scots-Irish, Balamani, who's down here, you can kind of get a sense that this is definitely a Scots-Irish family. So that's the Dobson books. Now, the other two things I've listed in, for you to do is in, also in the car catalog. It's And be sure you're typing the title, the first part of the title with the exact punctuation and space, because if you don't, the car catalog can't find it. But if you put in US Confederate, here are the entries from Ancestry for their databases, 
pertaining to Confederate service during the Civil War. And then the other one, here's an example of a, this is this Oliver H. Foster that I showed you his picture earlier. Here's his pension record for that. And then there's also the U.S. Presbyterian Church records. There, the Presbyterian Church is a very independent church, always has been. And so in the period of time we we're talking about pre-1800, the Presbyterian Church would not have been organized per se. There would have been individual localized Presbyterian congregations or camp meetings like the Chautauquas in up, upstate New York. But there, if there was an organized Presbyterian church, it was the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. And those records are included on the Ancestry database of U.S. Presbyterian Church records. And here is an example of one. This is most recent. This is 1946. But they have baptisms, marriages, and burials in, if the burials were kept in the church record. So that's from Ancestry. Be sure you check these Presbyterian records. Even if later they were Baptist, early on they very well would be, if anything, Presbyterian. And then if you're looking for the state databases under search, you go to all collections and then you scroll down to the bottom of the screen and now you have links for every state to go to the state databases that Ancestry has. That's the most efficient and quickest way to find the records for a given state in Ancestry. Now, as a reminder, no matter how much you can find online, you are going to eventually have to do on the ground research. And don't forget all of these places that have information. So public libraries with large family history collections, such as the Houston Library, the Mid-Continent Library in Kansas City, the Allen County Library in Fort Wayne, Indiana, uh, the State Archives of Pennsylvania, which would be the next line, the Wisconsin State Historical Society in Madison, the, the BYU Library, the Family Search Library in Salt Lake, and so on. Your state and county archives and libraries, don't forget your local libraries, even if they're small, they are going to have local history information, then certainly your local societies and cemeteries. And don't forget, look to see if there's a local family search center. Because if there is, the staff there will know the local area better than anybody else sometimes because they're the ones who are actually doing the research. And so I always try, if there is a center, I always make sure I do spend some time there. Don't forget the bibliography. I wanted you to be aware of one book in particular on that bibliography. It's called Founding of the Cumberland Settlements. This is focusing on the North Carolina settlement of Central and Eastern Tennessee, but primarily Central Middle Tennessee. It's the first book of three, and they're all expensive. They're all over $200 if you can find a copy. This volume is actually out of print. Only volume two is still in print. But you can use WorldCat, W-O-R-L-D-C-A-T dot org, to find what library near you may have a copy of this book. And here's an example of what you can find in the book. There's a digital copy. They have it in CD-ROM version in, in the back of the book of every land grant of Middle Tennessee in this particular volume of every land grant from every person who received land, who either kept it or sold it in that area and here's a description of the land actual little map drawn and then the legal description and so on and this is to, and it tells you how large it is and this is for james adam and archibald clinton who were the assignees of samuel price it's 640 acres on the east fork of bledsoe's creek and the grant was issued in 1800 bledsoe's creek is a little to the north and east of Nashville. There are, oh, there are thousands of these included in that volume. And I'm gonna go back one arrow so you know which one I'm talking about. Founding of the Cumberland Settlements, the first atlas, 1779 to 1804. There are, these particular authors have two additional volumes which came later, 
but this is the one that gives you the early before 1800, which is where most people are trying to get to. And then a reminder, good family history research means you work backwards. So even though you have a Scots-Irish name and they're settled in Southern Illinois or Missouri, so you think they came from Tennessee, so you're gonna just jump into the Tennessee records. That's not the best way to work. You finish with every source you can find in Illinois or Missouri, get all of the records there because those are going to give you the clues as to where in Tennessee you need to start looking or in Kentucky or the Carolinas or whatever. We do our best research when we work backwards and not try to jump to a new area or a new generation before we finished working on the current generation. And so finally, you can do it. So I'm going to switch back, stop share, and we can start looking at chat. Um, excellent presentation. Thank you for the good words, everyone. Uh, let's see, lots of thank you. Whoops, I went to the wrong era. Let's see, any questions? Uh, no McGuire's. That's because it's an Irish name. It's not a Scots-Irish name. Uh, sometimes the mix confuse us because Mick is Gaelic and it just stands for the same thing in both Scotland or Ireland. It means son of a guire. If there are books on Irish surnames very similar to Blacks on the surnames of Scotland that give you an excellent background on the Irish names. I didn't include them because they are mostly for the Republic. There is one book now becoming available that I've not actually looked at for the Ulster area that the Ulster Historical Foundation has published on the surnames of Ulster. And I've yet to look at that one, but there I know that is a new publication. But Maguire is Irish, that's why. Um, handout link we talked about. Did I miss any questions, Olivia? It doesn't look like we have, oh, we just got a question. Is there a history of migration of Scots-Irish to the Midwest? As, as a broad area, no. By state, there is in the county histories that were published around seven, in 1876 for the U.S. Centennial. Uh, if you go to, now for instance, one of the counties I'm working on is Jackson County, Illinois, which is down in the southern quarter of the state and it the published by a history of Jackson County has a description and discussion of the settlement coming out of Tennessee and Kentucky to that area primarily for mining in the mid 19th century and then earlier just because there was free land up there and it was easy to get to by way of the Wabash and the Ohio Ohio rivers, but you've got to do it by state. There is no large overview history of the Midwest, except for things like the Germans, because that was such a large group of the mid 19th century, or the Scandinavians, I've seen one on that, but not on the Scots-Irish. And I think it's because they were so early and so much part of the, of the fabric of the area that at the time they started writing histories, it wasn't thought to be that special, I guess would be the way to put it. But I do go with the county histories for most of that. The name Patterson, I would go to Black Surname. And remember I said that's one of the digital books on Family Search to get the background of Patterson. I don't know it off the top of my head. Um, Anything else? Because we're just about past, we're actually we're past 705. So I'm going to turn it back over to you, Olivia. All right, perfect. Thank you for those questions and comments, everybody. We'll go ahead and close. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you will join us for our next webinar, which is on February 23rd with Roger Miner. He will be giving a presentation entitled German Census Records from 1816 to 1916. A recording of this webinar will be made available next week. You can view that on our YouTube channel or on our website. If you have any comments,
answer questions, you can always email us at FHL underscore webinars at byu.edu or follow Facebook and Twitter. Thank you and have a wonderful week.